Hi everyone. Before we begin, I'd like to ask everyone a question. How many of you hate autocorrect? I'm guessing at least half of you would probably raise your hand if we were in a room together. Most UX talks will talk about how user experience design brings clarity, removes obstacles, it rewards users for making us feel accomplished, successful, and happy. This is not gonna be one of those talks. We're gonna explore the world of user manipulation. But first, a little, about, a little bit about me. I'm a technical accessibility specialist at Gallup in Omaha, Nebraska. And if you immediately thought Gallup, the polling company, yes, that would be the one, although we do much more than that. Uh, if you watched Jeanette's talk earlier, she talked about Strains Finder in there. I, I am actually going to talk about that because that is one of Gallup's products. Uh, I've been in some form of user experience roles for about 10 years now. I work in a new niche UX market where I help create a better user experience for people who are temporarily, situationally, or permanently disabled. And a side note, a portion of this talk was written pre-pandemic, so we're all going to get to remember what booking flights and hotels is like if you haven't had that pleasure yet. And I should also warn you that I'm probably gonna make you second guess what's happening for most of your e-com purchases that you make from now on, and I'm a little bit sorry about it. When I first started at Gallup around seven years ago, I worked on our e-commerce sites as a UX developer. I spent four years working on our customer experience determining ways that we could create a better UX and UI, and basically how to get people to press the buy and give us their credit card details faster. Our stakeholders closely watched the metrics of purchasing, hoping to see increased revenue. On the UX team, we assist by gathering analytics data, conducting user research, and creating A-B tests and multivariate experiments to make improvements. And these website experiments work. Qubit has published a meta-analysis of different web experiments that they conducted. You can grab the PDF at the link above, and if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. They aggregate thousands of tests and categorize them by the nature of the experiment to determine what kinds of experiments yield the best results. They found that certain types of features performed consistently well in increasing how much money you can make from a single transaction. In addition to increasing the amount spent some experiments are shown to be particularly effective at increasing the number of sales in general. To clarify what some of these categorizations mean, scarcity would be a limited stock, special editions, social proof, things like review scores, popular items, and seeing that people had also made that same choice. Urgency, time limits, countdowns, abandonment, reminders of what you have in your cart or what you've been looking at recently. The top five items here have a greater than 70% chance of working and can increase revenue in the best case as much as 6%. When you make millions of dollars a year, that's a lot of money. We all know why these experiments work. They work because user experience design is an application of psychology. The types of experiments that Qubit show working are the ones that most directly draw upon what we understand about people's habits and desires. Psychology is the UX designer's greatest tool. But like all tools, it must be used with care. So what kind of lessons do we learn as UX designers? In Don't Make Me Think, Steve Krug teaches us that we don't read pages. An honest UX designer will use this to aid rapid comprehension using concepts like visual hierarchy to allow users to quickly find what they need. A dishonest designer can use this to hide information which may be useful to the user, but inconvenient to the business. Jacob Nielsen of the Nielsen and Norman Group tells us that people tend to stick to the default choice. In honest design, we can use this to avoid unnecessary mistakes. For instance, if most of your customers are from the US, maybe you make that the default address country when they're checking out. Manipulative design would use defaults as tricks, hoping that the user either won't notice or are confronted with a burdensome challenge when they need to correct it later. These are things like, automatically signing you up for marketing emails. Robert Cialdini in Influence the Psychology of Persuasion tells us that people tend to follow other people's leads. An honest design may show an unfiltered list of reviews, but a dishonest one might pick and choose, only showing the positive feedback. These manipulative techniques are what we collectively call dark patterns. Harry Brignall coined this term in 2010. He is a UX designer from Brighton, England, who started this website to raise awareness. 
The site names and shames organizations using these techniques. Brignall identifies numerous distinct patterns. There's 12 of them to be exact. Things like trick questions and sneak into basket, hidden costs, confirm shaming, friend, friend spam. I'm gonna go through most of these and show you how they work in practice. A lot of them are often combined together. Let's start with the oldest dark pattern. Trick questions have existed throughout human history. Gallup, as a polling company, knows to stay clear of this dark pattern in order to maintain a, the scientific data of our results. Trick questions are a kind of user trap, forcing them to agree to things that they did not intend. Advanced techniques use a combination of tricks to ensnare users. This is a trammel net, a type of fishing net where fish may manage to avoid one net to only be caught by another. This is from the press juicery. I'm really unsure if the cancel button cancels my membership or if it cancels me out of the user flow. I'm also unsure if the continue button continues my membership or if it continues canceling it. These instructions are not clear and it's not easy to cancel your membership. There's also been a big uptick in tricky questions around users consenting to allow cookies on websites. For this particular example, you need to click that hidden confirm selection link that is above the select all and confirm giant red button there in order to get the cookies that you selected to actually be the cookies you selected. Because C is for cookies and cookies are for everyone on the internet to track your data with. In the UK, the Postal Service, the Royal Mail are presumably familiar with this. Hidden in a wall of text are questions designed to trip you up. If you want to avoid being signed up for emails, you need to click the first set of checkboxes there. However, you have to be careful to not click the second set of checkboxes because those have the opposite logic where they're gonna opt you in. Of course, this is all okay because they adhere to the Data Protection Act of 1981. As a side note, I'm gonna mention this modern strategy. It's not so much a trick question as it is an emotional manipulation to promote a particular response. This has started appearing over the last few years. This sort of thing is called confirm shaming. If you want to opt out, you have to choose a patronizing or self-deprecating option, like Gmail telling you that you don't want smarter email, or the tasting table making you click, I don't eat. It's possible that designers think that this is cute or funny, but it isn't, and they just need to stop. Also, why is the silverware under the plate in this picture? That's just idiotic. Privacy zuckering is another modern dark pattern. The silly name isn't especially self-descriptive, but I'll try to explain. Privacy zuckering suckers you into sharing something with your friends on social media. This will sometimes expose your entire list of contacts to a third party. And yes, privacy zuckering is named after everyone's favorite social media CEO. To find out what's in this month's Ipsy Glam Bag, you have to share it on social media. These attempts are manipulative. And they tend to, but they tend to at least be upfront about what's going on. Regardless, I suspect most users are unaware of the full consequences here. LinkedIn, for instance, have been the industry leader in desperately trying to get access to your contact network. In 2015, their sign-up process contained a manipulative practice where as part of setting up your account, it asked you to confirm your Google account, which is what you see on the screen here. Email verification is very common, and Gmail is the largest email provider, so this caught a lot of people off guard. This option was not an email confirmation at all, nor was it asking for the email address. They have already asked you for that. By clicking the Confirm My Google Account button, it would prompt you to give LinkedIn permission to access your email and address book. LinkedIn used this in both directions. You would have contacts already on LinkedIn invited to your network, and everyone else would get an email from LinkedIn saying that you have invited them to join LinkedIn. LinkedIn was sued $13 million for unsolicited email spam as a result of these practices. The correct option here is to click that send a confirmation email instead of the primary action button. And this is also an example of our next pattern. Misdirection is an aspect of many other dark patterns. The basic idea is to try to lead the user away from what they want to do so that you can make them do what you want them to instead. This is the screen you will see when you click the check-in button on Delta. 
I first saw this a few years ago and found it pretty offensive. It seems like every airline these days is doing something like this. You will note that the main call to action does not have anything to do with checking in. You thought that you thought that, that was what you were going to do, but Delta would like you to do something else. They would like you to pay them more money. Uh, you are presented with a choice of with radio buttons, which by default tells users that they need to choose one or the other. And But both are going to upgrade your ticket for a fee. Because when you booked this ticket, you happened to forget that you wanted to pay $169 each way to fly first class, said nobody ever. To get out of this, you have to click that gray, no thanks, continue checking in button, which is just not something that most users would see when they look at this page. Delta at least show their options in plain sight. Log me in, have a sign up process where to opt out of emails, you have to click this link and then which reveals a hidden checkbox and then uncheck it. I'm pretty sure our legal team would be big mad at me if I built this on one of our websites. Hiding things works in emails too. Here, the unsubscribed link circled in red uh, is styled to look identical to the rest of the text. There are other examples where the link is the same color as the background. You can meet that cam spam rule, but being sketchy about it isn't something that I would encourage. Even when the options are visible, UX can screw over people who rely on keyboards to navigate. The tab order for this form will take you to the submit button instead of the checkbox to opt out of email marketing. If you fill out forms by tabbing through them, this misdirection will trip you up. If you rely on a keyboard and screen reader to navigate the web, you may never be informed of this consent checkbox. This is not consent and the GDPR agrees. Remember confirm shaming from a couple minutes ago? If you have learned to choose the self-deprecating option, you will be tripped up by this pop-up. The way to skip this ad is to actually click the link in the bottom right of the screen that says thanks but no thanks in yellow. And this is a typical example of using your own experience against you. There's a term for this special kind of misdirection, the bait and switch. This pattern is prolific on websites, aggressively seeking ad clicks. Anyone who has tried to avoid the sea of fake download buttons on a website where you get free software will know this tactic well. The bait and switch can also be very subtle as it relies on subverting the user's expectations of what the action should do. To encourage users to upgrade from the excellent Windows 7 to the not convincingly better Windows 10, Microsoft employed pop-ups in the operating system. For months, users became accustomed to just dismissing a pop-up telling them to upgrade. M Microsoft later changed the upgrade to a recommended update. And Microsoft then showed this pop-up that's on the screen to inform the user. If, like always, they clicked the X to close the pop-up, Windows 10 would install, which is the opposite interaction of what they've been doing for months. To avoid it, they have to click the here link, which is the smallest one in the modal. It's right below Sunday in the date. Um, they then could unsubs unschedule the upgrade, which is a complex task for some Windows users. We never read terms and conditions, and why would we? The iTunes agreement has at least 56 pages of them. I'm sure it's more by now. So we accept them out of habit. UX designers can abuse this. This looks like a terms and conditions page, but it's actually an opt-in for unwanted software. The designer hopes that the user will press accept just like they always do instead of skip. Our habits as smartphone users can also be abused by advertisers. The ad on the left has a speck of dust on it to encourage someone to tap the ad as they try and clean their screen. The Instagram ad on the right has a hair placed on the image, hoping that the user will swipe up to remove it. Video game designers can also take advantage of the medium's repetitious nature. In a game with short levels, users will repeatedly hit this green primary action button to start the next level, especially early on when the levels are easy. Then when you run out of lives, the button that you instinctively press has become a buy actions move, initiating an in-app payment. This action isn't required, you could restart the level, but to do so, you need to press that X that's next to it, which you haven't done to start a level before. On the subject of tricking people into buying things, our next pattern is going to be sneak into basket. 
These screenshots are from a talk that was given a few years ago, but earlier this week, I went back and validated them. And guess what? They're still roughly the same, minus some content and branding updates. GoDaddy's updated their logo since then. Uh, so I'm going to go look at GoDaddy and see how easy it would be to buy a domain for a year. I get to the homepage and it says, oh, domains as low as 99 cents for your first year. So let's click that find your domain button. I'm going to search for a domain. I see now that the 99 cents is for .fun and I want a .com. That's okay. 11.99 sounds good. And we're going to take a quick time travel to today's site. Uh, this page is now a comparison screen where userpatterns.com is more than user-patterns.com because apparently a hyphen is worth negative $8. I don't really know. Anyway, back to the old flow. Uh, in this search, I can see that the main domain that I want, the .com, and it's great. I can add to that. I can also see some upsells. There's a .us add-on and a buy three and save 69% offer. I'm going to ignore those for now, but I will come back to this bundle later. I also note that there is a filter option to the left, uh, which lets you choose which top level domains you want to look at. The checkbox style on this site is a solid green with a white check mark. This will become relevant in a couple of slides. Another upsell on the next page with privacy selection detected by at, selected by default. As it happens, most other registrars now offer this for free because it's possible who is doesn't comply with GDPR. That's fine. I can choose no thanks here and it's fairly straightforward and I'll save another eight dollars. And then here's another add-on for email. Also optional and the default is not selected, which isn't too bad. They had redesigned this a couple of years ago though because it used to include this. This checkbox looks like decoration, and it's not the same style as those checkboxes that you saw a couple slides ago, but it's not decoration at all. That's an actual checkbox. This would sneak an item into your basket that you would be charged for for a month from now, and you can click the image to deselect this add-on. They've thankfully removed this, and it doesn't seem like it has come back, but who knows when you try it yourself, it might actually be on there in a different spot on their site. Once we pass by the add-ons, we get to the real start of the checkout process. In addition to being inundated by promotions, there's another nasty default here. The domain registration is set to two years, which makes the price $26.98 compared to $11.99. The extra year was added in without my decision. I can change it, it's just that drop down there. However, if you cast your mind back to the promotion I avoided early on, which said I could buy three domains for $18, this is the screen I would have seen if I had chosen that upsell. The $18 price is only for the added domains and only if you change both of the durations back to one year. Otherwise, my purchase becomes $105, which is quite a difference. It's not just digital products that sneak into basket can happen with. It can happen with physical items as well. When you are renting a cargo van, this Canadian site will pre-select a selection of shipping supplies that, should you choose the primary option, would add them to your cart. Can you imagine this happening inside of an actual store? I'm wheeling my cart around a grocery store, minding my own business, while I'm picking out carrots from the fresh produce section and a store manager just slips a bag of rosemary in there because it might go well together and they're just being helpful. There's also the semi-famous recent screenshot from Reddit of a different kind of sneak into basket. If you order exactly $15 worth of food from DoorDash, they give you a one cent discount so you don't get free delivery. And that's just wrong. One of the more famous examples of sneak into basket comes from budget airline Ryanair. We know that people don't read, and they are familiar with the task of filling out passenger details. Title, first name, last name, country of residence. They fill it out and they don't consider the text. If you actually choose a country of residence here, you will have chosen to buy trip insurance. And the option is also required. If you try to progress, it will bring up a big red box around the please select a country of residence. And this is evil genius levels of trickery. To opt out, you have to find the no travel insurance required option, which is located between Latvia and Lithuania. 
Uh, yes, right there, south of Riga. While Ryan and Air were deliberate in their evil, these things can happen unintentionally. Sometimes by following best practices for revenue or engagement, you can follow a dark pattern by accident. Hidden costs are particularly prone to this. And a little confession time, we at Gallup have unintentionally done this practice. We were looking at methods to improve the sale completion on Gallup's Strength Center, a website that has been since redesigned and migrated to a new site. Like none of this exists in the wild anymore. One solution we tried to leverage was the psychological principles behind abandonment. To buy on Gallup's Strength Center, you need to register for a Gallup account. This is several steps long, so we wanted to encourage you to follow through. We hypothesize that by showing you what you will lose if you don't complete a sale, we'll encourage you to complete it. Let me demonstrate one use case for this. Here, I add a copy of our book, Strengths-Based Selling, to my cart. In this design, we show a persistent cart throughout the whole checkout process, and we make it clear what the stages of the checkout are. I can see my item here at the sign-in or register phase. Uh, we do not support guest checkout on the site, or at least we didn't at this time, so the user has to register and confirm their email address, which is okay because at this point you really want that book. Like, you see it sitting there, you need to sign up. So I add my billion shipping address as normal. This time I'm going to send a copy of this book to a friend in England. Until I added an address, the site couldn't calculate shipping because we don't know where we're shipping it to. So this is the first time that we list shipping on the cart summary page. The primary action on this page is to enter your credit card details. An unintended side effect of showing this cart on every page is that the user is now blind to it. You don't check that part of the page anymore. They don't notice the shipping, even though the shipping calculation during checkout is fairly standard. And if you notice, the shipping is $55.21 here. Uh, once I enter the credit card details, the purchase completes immediately without the user noticing the shipping. And internationally, the shipping is very expensive. Before this design change, it wasn't really a problem on our site. We only showed the cart on this step until now. People also expect shipping costs, and the only physical product we sold on the site before the redesign was a very expensive, literal suitcase sized coaching kit. The shipping to item cost ratio wasn't out of the ordinary on a product that size, so we just defaulted that shipping method for that item. We have since then added books and other cheaper items around the time that we made this design change. We have since changed the design in many ways. This page doesn't even exist and it looks completely different now, but the final design on this particular site had you choosing a shipping method which means that the user can actually choose how much they want to spend on shipping. The user knows what they're paying for here and they can make an informed choice. We've also added free shipping tiers for domestic and international orders. The only thing worse than getting something you didn't want is when it's hard to get back out of it. And this pattern's called a Roach Motel. I don't know if anyone is a subscriber to NFL Game Pass, but that's where we're going next. If any of you have ever stopped being a tried to stop being a subscriber to NFL Game Pass, you will know it is very hard. You can't, if you can't work out how to cancel your own subscription, you can contact customer support. This happens enough that it's a category of its own on their Contact Us page. If you do contact support, you will get this email with instructions on how to opt out. It doesn't seem so bad. You sign in, go to your account, choose subscriptions, choose learn more, and then opt out. Okay, that seems pretty easy. Except these instructions are a lie. There is no learn more, there is no opt out. You can either call customer support on the phone or cancel your credit card. Those are your choices. Have you ever tried to log into Spotify with an account that you originally created via Facebook, your Facebook account? I have, and it becomes especially difficult when you deactivate your Facebook account. This is true with any website, not just Spotify. For those of you who sign up using other services uh, on login pages, a few years ago, this step used to automatically reactivate your Facebook account, which was very cool. And today, the flow looks a little something like this. First, it tells you that you don't have the right username or password, which is fine. I can just reset that. 
But then you get told that your account was disabled, which is also fine, but how do I enable it? Well, there's a nice contact Spotify, Spotify support link down there. And that's where things get a little funky. You have to fill out a contact form that is buried several clicks deep in an FAQ section, where you then chat with a client support rep, where they then ask you to remember your Facebook username. It took me over five years to get into my Spotify account since deactivating Facebook, and they eventually just reset my email and I had to sign up for a new Spotify account. This is a Roche Motel if I've ever seen one. Roche Motels are easy to get in and hard to get out. Gyms are especially good at this. Easy in, there's a million different ways that you can sign up and you don't need to pay a penny today. Difficult out, you need to print out this form, mail it to this P.O. box number, and hope that we don't lose it before we charge you for next year's expensive membership. This kind of subscription model is its own dark pattern called forced continuity. The FTC refers to this as negative options. The definition varies. Some will say that this covers all first month free style offers. Others use this to describe situations that force you to subscribe to product B to get product A. Either way, this practice is now illegal in the EU, and I'm sure most of you have signed up for a service that uses some type of automatic charge after a free period. Live Nation was sued for abusing this pattern. When first selling concert tickets, they used a sneaky opt-out only subscription to the Rolling Stone magazine. Free for the first month, $12.95 thereafter. Unsubscribing from this also required mailing in a cancellation. Are you worried about being sued about this? Don't worry, the FTC has a blog post to help you keep your subscription scam legal. You can find it at this bit.ly link. And the last pattern that I'm going to talk about today, I've called fake advantage. This is not directly named on darkpatterns.org, so the definition is my own. I've observed a massive growth in this pattern, and frankly, it's an unfortunate sign of the times that you can no longer trust things you see on the internet. Let's take another look at the table from Qubit. The top three here rely on psychological factors that make you feel like you have a chance of a lifetime, so you better take it now. There's only a few left, other people are buying this one, so I need to too, and there's only a limited amount of time before this goes. But what if this perceived opportunity was exaggerated? This is a room grid that you can see on booking.com. When you're searching for a cheap hotel room, before this page would have, before this page, you would have chosen a hotel, this specific one from a list of search results. There's a lot going on here and most of it is irrelevant. A big red, someone just booked this banner with a clock icon doesn't indicate whether it's on the same date that you're looking for. And the same is true of the claim that 33 people are looking at this now. Even if someone booked these exact dates, they will show this notice if someone booked as much as 24 hours ago. When booking a date isn't exactly urgent, but it adds both a sense of urgency and social proof. Only three rooms indicate, only three rooms left indicates that scarcity, that there's scarcity here. Maybe it is, or maybe they will still have three rooms tomorrow. There's also a section that says 33 other people are looking right now, according to our booking.com travel scientists. Don't blame scientists for your dark doings right here. The jackpot notice is hilariously misleading. Even though you saw other hotels with prices on your search results, this is the first hotel that you have looked at rooms for. So obviously it will be the first one and it will be the cheapest one you've seen because it's the only one you've seen every time. This is not an advantage. The discount here also looks like a good deal, but you don't have a means to compare the rates. When you hover over the text, you get this giant wall of text. And if you read it and think about it, the genius benefit basically translates to this room is in the cheapest 95% of rooms, which is not much of an advantage. Finally, we have the review score, more social proof, except booking.com uses a considerably skewed scale. Each category has four ratings with different smiley faces. These equate to the values from highest to lowest of 10, 7.5, 5, and 2.5. The total score is a grand mean of these. So even if you think the cleanliness was the worst you've ever seen, provided the location was good and the place was cheap, you'll still likely give this a good score because the rating is biased. 
this score is then exaggerated with all, or is then ad aggregated with all of the other probably good scores. A better distribution of these values would be one, four, seven, and 10. Scarcity, social proof, urgency, all exaggerated. There are aspects of truth on booking.com, but they blow them out of proportion. But what if we took this a step further? What if we just straight up lied about the advantage that you have? I'm going to visit Viagogo, a third-party event ticket reseller. Even if you are not familiar with this particular vendor, you are presumably familiar with online ticket sales. You can find them in Dante's Circle of Hell between the Gluttons and the Wrathful. I should note that this video I'm going to show you is from 2018, but I revalidated it a couple weeks ago and it's identical. Literally nothing has changed except the dates and the events. This video is going to show me looking for tickets to Pearl Jam in Seattle. These tickets have been on sale for some time. Once you choose an event, you are presented with this progress bar where they tell you that they are looking for available tickets. You are shown that people are currently looking at tickets and that only 1% of tickets remain. In a prior design, Viagogo actually showed a visual cue of people ahead of you, indicating that you are waiting for other people to finish their purchases before having a chance at buying. They would then stack other people visually behind you, and these days they just have you stare at this progress bar. The interesting thing about this progress bar is that it's entirely fake. There are no network requests that are updating the status. It's literally just making you wait 60 seconds before you can see if there's any tickets left. The result here is growing tension. What if these people buy the last of the good seats? Let's see what happens when they find tickets for me. Choose the number of tickets here. Oh no, they're literally selling out right before my eyes. All the tickets have sold out and they've sold out. And if I don't hurry, that hot, hot, hot ticket that they have marked there might sell out and I need to buy it immediately. This is all totally fake. These tickets didn't sell out just now. They sold out days ago. Here's a code snippet from StubHub. They were shamed on social media for this exact practice. The code here is easy to read. Uh, if there are five or more listings, insert a sold out listing into a random position from two to five. If your boss asks you to write this code, please tell them no. But you might say, metrics show that these strategies work. So if they work, shouldn't we be doing them? Well, while I hope you already know the answer to this, let me give you some pretty simple reasons why reproducing these dark patterns can be very bad for business. Customer service calls are not free. They're also not cheap. Credit card chargebacks are expensive. If users feel that they have been missold and complain about it, it can cost more than the extra revenue that you intended to make. There's also legal liability. Many of the companies using these tactics have been sued. Can you be sure that the gains are worth the risk being involved in a civil or federal lawsuit? Some of the examples shown here today are in direct violation of the GDPR, which if you have EU customers, could see you faced with some truly massive fines. And finally, your reputation's at risk. At the start of this talk, I asked everyone if they hated autocorrect. Roy Baumeister in his paper, The Bad is Stronger Than the Good, draws on a wide range of peer-reviewed studies showing that negative experiences have a far greater impact than positive ones. Autocorrect likely fixes typos and speeds up your texting a vast majority of the time. If texting were better without autocomplete, it just simply wouldn't exist. Except that's not what we remember. We remember this. This is the most safe for work example that I could find. Remembering painful, or in this case, embarrassing things is an evolutionary advantage. If we remember the time that something hurt, we will hopefully not repeat it and we will live longer. This is the reason that your brain will continue to remind you of that dumb thing you did at school, even though everyone definitely called their teacher mom at some point. This memory also applies to negative brand interactions. If people have a bad experience on your website because of deceitful design, they will need a lot of positive experiences to overcome the negative opinion of your brand. 
You may make the sale, but you've probably lost the customer and their friends. In conclusion, you've heard about the dark side, and now you can be more aware of how you're designing, and just don't let people sneak dark patterns into your company's UX. You can now also be more aware of how other companies are trying to manipulate you into buying things when you're on the internet. Here's uh, all of the resources that I've mentioned in this presentation. I've also added a couple of Twitter accounts that are fun follows. If you're on Twitter, uh, you can take a screenshot of this if you want to. And then thank you all for coming to your talk. I'm going to open this up for Q&A, and you can find my slides at that link. Courtney, that was excellent. Uh, <laughs> we were it, here at the watch party. We were having like audible gasps at some of the stuff you were showing. Uh, Good. That, uh, uh, we we felt manipulated. I think was the takeaway. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, we do have a, 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 some great questions. Let's just jump right in. Um, so this one's from Tim. Um, this is about Zuckering. Um, does the chain letter Facebook post that people share around giving details like uh, age, faith, foods, et cetera, and other things uh, count as Zuckering. People give away a huge amount of personal information and demos on Facebook in the name of fun. I would say yes to an extent. It's also a like cybersecurity risk because you're giving, oftentimes those forms are geared towards security questions that like your bank might have. And so it's a way if people are in your social network uh to potentially hack into your bank account and steal all of your money which is also not great agreed um okay this one's from julia uh is lawyering the only way to fight back against ux crimes uh what can we do when we run into these dark design patterns outside of our own company i like i personally prefer the naming and shaming aspect uh there are there's a whole subreddit dedicated to dark patterns. There's several Twitter accounts and the darkpatterns.org website. So if you see something, take screenshots of it and send it off to one of those so you can have more people be informed and there will for sure be other people that have ha ran into that same experience. This one's from David. Uh, how often is the UX manipulation a developer's choice or is it more often a marketing team's decision or is it a customer's decision? Kind of where does the decision lie? I think it's kind of all of them. Um, I think any one particular person could suggest it. And then if everyone agrees to it, it's kind of a team decision. Most features aren't developed in a silo of like only one person making a choice. Uh, there's definitely things that I think about when I was a developer even five, 10 years ago, that I've made developer design choices that have probably been a dark pattern thinking back on it. But I also think that there's things that like a stakeholder has suggested that would be a dark pattern too. I couldn't agree more. I say that as like, as a developer, I've definitely had my, <laughs> things are haunting me right now that I know I've done. There's, I've also done the opposite where I've gone like, okay, let's make this opt opt in not opt out like yes. trying, to, trying to fix some past sins as it were um okay uh this one is from doji and he said i've signed up for a subscription service i don't want to continue the service it's a one-year subscription but the option to cancel my renewal is only available three weeks before my subscription renews i can't do it now that's fresh in my mind how do we combat this without having to resort to things like using a calendar um, how do we get web designers to fix this? I, I think you might have covered a little bit, but I'm curious if you have a different take for this one. I would complain to the company, honestly. I would like write into their customer support and ask them if there's any way that they could cancel my subscription early. I think the more customer complaints that they get about that, the more likely they are to fix that business problem uh, just because customer support calls cost. Like if that's, you know, 10% of their calls, they're gonna stop wanting to do that. This is another one from Tim. Um, what would you say is the single worst UX practice in vogue today? Oh, oh, 
I don't even know if I could answer that question. That's a tough one. I All the dark patterns are honestly some of the worst. I also work in accessibility and like that's my primary job right now. And I really hate the uh, lack of contrast on the web. That's one of a big problem that I see. Um, it makes it really hard for all of us, including people with visual disabilities to see. Um, that's a tough one. The, the, he, he calls out one below and it's, how do you feel about autoplay videos on sites? Oh, that's the worst. <laughs> the, 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 the video jumping up a bit or second to after the page load. So you clicked it rather than, than clicking to close. Same thing with ads jumping around the, the yep. target practice. That, those are all good examples of terrible practices on the web. I don't know if call it like fly swatting. I'm trying to think. Um, yes. Okay. Uh, this one's from, from uh, Joffrey. Uh, other professions have licenses like engineers with the PE. Should there be some sort of licensing for IT in general or certain positions, perhaps like an ethics license or something? That's a really good idea. Um, I haven't ever thought about that one. Yes, to an extent. I think if you're making business decisions on a website, whether that's like a stakeholder on like more of a business site or like a technical developer, project manager, designer role, that yeah, you should have some ethical contract that you're kind of aligned to. It's actually a really good, really good question. Good idea. I'm thinking of like a, a dark pattern rating for your site. Yes. <laughs> Everyone gets a little rating at the bottom of like, you're just going to, like, this isn't going to be a fun experience because we're just manipulating you five out of five. Um, so uh, one, uh, one uh, question. Um, they said, first, they loved your talk. Um, they wanted to know if you had any okay. material uh, that overlaps dark UX patterns with social engineering attacks. Ooh, that kind of goes back to the first or second question you asked me with the Facebook social media um, questions that people ask. I don't have anything specifically, and that's the first example that comes to mind when I think about social engineering is all the like surveys that people share on the internet with like the street that they grew up on and their first car, which are all security questions. Totally. Oh, um, oh well, last question, I think. Um, do you think Google Core Web Vitals will help mitigate some of these practices? I haven't looked into Google Core Web Vitals. Maybe. I'll give you a solid maybe. That's not something that I've like dug into recently. And, and no worries. We'll we'll follow up on the thread for this. Um, Courtney is on the tech on the two hundred channel, so you can actually at her. Um, yep. Courtney, what's uh, best way for people to get a hold of you other than on the Slack we're on right now? You can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Courtney Heitman. It's C O U R T N E Y H E I T M A N, and I will follow you back. You can DM me if you have questions. You can at me and have ask more questions on there too if you want. Well, thank you so much for your talk today. I, I know the whole group appreciated it. We're, we're glad we had you. Um, Good. I'm glad. Thank you. <laughs> our next talk is going to be at 1115. So we'll take a seven-minute break. We'll see you here in a few. Thank you.